Welcome. I'm Fred Kemp. I'm President and CEO of the Atlantic Council, and it is a huge pleasure to welcome you to this critical discussion on the situation in Venezuela and the uh, not just local, not just regional, but global reverberations of a humanitarian crisis. I want to give a warm welcome to Adrian Arst, uh, who inspires us every day and whose vision uh, not only makes this event a reality, but Arsht, also the Arsh Latin America Center and the Adrian Arst Rockefeller Foundation Resilience Center. Uh, I also want to welcome the many diplomatic representatives who are here today and who will be speaking as part of today's program. I would like to give a special welcome uh, to the members of the Venezuelan delegation who are joining us today, Julio Borges, uh, Presidential Envoy for Foreign Affairs, uh, Carlos Vecchio, the, uh, our friend, the Ambassador to the United States, uh, and Miguel Pizarro, as, uh, recently named Special Representative uh, to, the, uh, to the United Nations. For those watching today's event, please feel free to tweet using the hashtag AC Venezuela, hashtag AC Venezuela. Uh, as world leaders gather nearby for the 74th session of the United Nations General Assembly, uh, this is a good moment uh, to ensure this urgent st issue stays on the top of the international agenda. After years of advancing freedom and democracy around the world, we've entered a new period of geopolitical uncertainty, great power competition, and there's actually been something of a recession in democratic freedoms um, since 2006, as measured by Freedom House. Uh, democracies seem to be in retreat and autocracies have been surging. And as autocrats seize every chance they get to expand their network of cronies and proxy states, the consequences are dire. Uh, and no, make, make no mistake, there are a number of countries uh, that do not necessarily want to see Venezuela go in a more democratic uh, direction. Propped up by a clique of autocrats and oligarchs from the Kremlin to Havana, Maduro's ongoing violations of economic, social, and political rights have wrecked which, what, what was once the richest, most stable democracy in Latin America. Today, Venezuelans' minimum wage sits at $7 per month. Nearly four million Venezuelans are malnourished. Survival is a constant struggle, and you know the numbers of refugees. In 2018, Venezuelan refugees filed more asylum claims globally than citizens of any other country. Um, uh, the, uh, and the number of Venezuelan migrants and refugees is on pace to soon surpass the total number of Syrian migrants and refugees. Across Latin America, countries have taken the burden of the humanitarian crisis without sufficient resources to address the needs of the migrant and refugee populations. Colombia, in particular, stands out for its efforts, but it's not alone. Unfortunately, the scale of the international response to date does not match the depth and the breadth of the crisis in Venezuela and the spillover impacts in the region and across the globe. The stakes are simply too high for us to be satisfied with the status quo. We're here to affirm and reaffirm the world's commitment to finding a peaceful and democratic resolution to the Western Hemisphere's largest man-made crisis. At the Atlantic Council, we don't see any of these challenges as a, as a cause for resignation, but rather as a call to action. The outcome of Venezuela's future will have generational impacts, most of all on the Venezuelan people, but what happens next will also have massive consequences for a world gripped by rising autocracy. Today's event convenes distinguished leaders from North America, Europe, and Latin America to provide renewed attention to the increasingly deteriorating humanitarian crisis within Venezuela, and to discuss ways in which the international community can address the middle and long-term impacts of the crisis on regional uh, security, prosperity, and stability. So thank you all for being here, and thank you all for working with us and many other communities to drive this issue. Now it's my profound pleasure for you to all give a warm welcome uh, via video uh, to the interim president of Venezuela, Juan Guaido, 
Uh, the president's remarks will be in Spanish, so please all put on your headphones who don't speak Spanish uh, if you need translation. Uh, Mr. President, we look forward to hearing from you via video. Un saludo a los presentes en este foro. Gracias a Tandy Council por esta oportunidad que nos brindan. Para nosotros, cada ventana es una oportunidad de mostrar a la comunidad internacional la tragedia que vive hoy nuestro país. Hoy en día Venezuela es víctima de la crisis económica, social, que ha destruido cualquier país latinoamericano. El régimen de Maduro nos ha hecho vivir una tragedia comparable solo con los que han vivido países en guerra o desbastados por desastres naturales. El sufrimiento de los venezolanos tiene y debe llegar a su fin. También de Maduro se excusa en las sanciones que la comunidad internacional le ha impuesto a funcionarios corruptos y violadores de derechos humanos, cuando en realidad los venezolanos estamos viviendo esta crisis desde hace muchos años. Hoy, producto de la corrupción, el abandono de la economía, del aparato productivo nacional, la crisis se ha recrudecido y millones están viviendo en pobreza extrema o han emigrado a nuestros países hermanos. Ustedes son testigos de las penurias de las que narran nuestros hermanos que hoy migraron a sus países. Ellos les han contado cómo sufrimos, cómo es nuestro día a día. El informe presentado por la alta comisionada de los derechos humanos, Michelle Bachelet, no deja espacio para la duda. En Venezuela vivimos un régimen opresor, autoritario, violador de derechos humanos, que condena a millones a vivir en la pobreza y la persecución. Esta situación tiene que acabarse. Debemos ponerle fin al sufrimiento de millones. Mientras el régimen de Maduro mantenga usurpando el poder, la situación seguirá e incluso empeorará. Este momento es el momento de la comunidad internacional, pero también de los venezolanos. Para mostrarse de lado una causa justa que mantiene unido a los venezolanos, a la gran mayoría de los venezolanos, pero sobre todo demostrar que las causas justas tienen soporte más allá de cualquier interés, que es el de preservar los derechos humanos y el de los seres humanos. Seguimos adelante. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Paola Garcia Dufro, Deputy Director of the Adrian Arsh Latin America Center. Good afternoon, everyone. It's always hard to follow an act uh, like that, uh, but we will do our best here today. Uh, thank you again for all of you joining us, both in the room today and as well via our, our, our webcast. Uh, we're delighted to have a distinguished panel with us uh, today to talk about this critical, uh, critical crisis going on in Venezuela, the role of the international community, um, and how we can all mobilize and coordinate our efforts uh, to, to bring an end to the current crisis um, and, and really fundamentally uh, end the suffering of the Venezuelan people, both in Venezuela and more broadly in the region and around the world. Um, our first panel will focus on the global reverberations of the Venezuelan crisis and steps the international community can take to address the humanitarian emergency in Venezuela and also to help meet the growing needs of the millions of migrants who have fled to neighboring countries in the region. Um, today, I also want to take a second to recognize two distinguished guests who have also joined us. Uh, we have in the room two brave Venezuelans who have been the victims of these abuses by the Maduro regime that the interim president, Guaido, uh, was just making references to. So I just want to acknowledge uh, your presence. Uh, Ms. Meudi Ocio de Alban, she is uh, the spouse and widow of Fernando Alban, who was um, killed while in custody of the regime. So we're delighted to have you here and we're honored uh, to have you here with us today. Um, I also want to recognize Armando. Thank you again for joining us. I also want to recognize Mr. Armando Obdola, 
who represents the Pamon tribe, who like all indigenous communities in Venezuela, have been victims of the Maduro regime's human rights abuses. So again, thank you for joining us. And if you can uh, join me in welcoming him as well. So we're gonna dive right in to discuss these important issues and resulting uh, humanitarian crisis in Venezuela. Please join me in welcoming um, our distinguished panel. With us today, we've got Ambassador Vecchio, Ambassador to the United States. Thank you again for joining Thanks, us, Carly. always a pleasure. Uh, we also have John Barsa, the Assistant Administrator for the Bureau for Latin America and the Caribbean from USAID, the US Agency for International Development. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Uh, we also have Ambassador Edita Herda, Managing Director for the Americas for the European External Action Service from the European Union. Thank you again for joining us. Mm -hmm. And last but not least, we've got Juan Pablo de la Iglesia, State Secretary for International Cooperation and for Ibero-American and the Caribbean from the Government of Spain. So thank you again for joining us. Um, as the interim president referenced in his remarks, last month the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Michelle Bachelet, released a report citing the grave violations of economic and social rights, including the rights to food and health committed in Venezuela at the hands of the regime. The UN Human Rights Commissioner has also warned that if the situation does not improve, the unprecedented outflow of Venezuelan migrants and refugees will continue, and the living conditions of those who remain in Venezuela will also continue to worsen. So uh, we're gonna dive right in, and Ambassador Vicky, I'm gonna direct my first question to you. Having seen and lived through the deterioration of living conditions in Venezuela firsthand, I wanna just turn to you to set, set the stage for us here in terms of what are the most critical issues uh, that we as an international community must address in order to bring an end to the complex humanitarian uh, emergency in Venezuela and obviously the resulting migration crisis afflicting the region. Yeah, well, thank you very much, Paula. Thank you very much, everyone. I wanna thank the Atlantic Council for, you know, for doing this event in order to highlight uh, the humanitarian crisis in Venezuela. Uh, this is not about Maduro or about Guaido. This is about the suffering of the people. We need to stop this right away. We need to stop the assassinations by people like Alvan or the people of the uh, indigenous community inside of Venezuela. So we need to keep that in mind. And I would say, I will highlight three uh, uh, issues uh, regarding this uh, uh, crisis. One, the political one. We cannot forget that this crisis is a man-made disaster. This crisis has been created by a system implemented by Maduro. So if we want to resolve the Venezuelan crisis and to stop the suffering of the Venezuelan, we need to change the regime. We need to put all the pressure in order to facilitate a peaceful transition in our country because it's the only way to attend uh, the magnitude of this crisis. The second one, I would say, is uh, the security one. Um, as you know, uh, Maduro is supporting uh, the presence of, uh, of terrorist group uh, such as ELN and, uh, and now dissidents from FARC. Uh, those uh, groups have been involved in drug trafficking and doing uh, criminal activities inside of Venezuela and against Colombia as well. So if we do not address this one, it will become more complicated in the future. And the third one is, of course, the uh, migration uh, refugee crisis or the, the flow of people you know, across the, the region, but also the humanitarian aid that people inside of Venezuela needs because normally we forget this. this. According to the last report from the from the UN, uh, seven million people need humanitarian aid inside of Venezuela, inside of Venezuela. And so far they have reached only uh, a less than $200 million to attend this situation and all, only to address 2.5 million Venezuelans inside of our country. We need to highlight this, this is quite important. We need to, to, uh, to highlight that the Venezuelan people inside of our country need more support uh, in order to alleviate the suffering, but at the same time, we need to attend the refugee crisis. As you know, this is the most important refugee crisis in this hemisphere. It's the second one uh, uh, around the world, and it could become the first one if this situation continues as it is. So in our view, these are the most important things, and this has to be addressed not only by the international community, by us, because this is a movement led by Venezuelans that need the support of the international community. So the combination of people inside of Venezuela under the leadership of Juan Guaido as an interim president and the international community, in my view, is the key to force for a transition in our country. 
So thank you for that. We're going to get to a lot more of what more can the international community do and what more can all of us who are here today and are obviously deeply committed to, to the cause uh, can all do to, to do more. Um, I'm going to turn over to you, uh, Assistant Administrator. Speaking of uh, the need for this to be a priority and the importance that, that the United States and the international community has now increasingly placed on the crisis in Venezuela, I think there has been an elevated awareness of the depth and breadth of the crisis. Uh, the importance, as you rightly um, uh, mentioned, Ambassador, uh, of the crisis uh, for the region uh, and more broadly for, for the global community. So the United States has obviously made significant commitments to address the growing humanitarian crisis in the region. Most recently, on, in September 4th, uh, U.S. Deputy Secretary of State John Sullivan and USAID Administrator Mark Green announced more than $120 million uh, additional dollars in humanitarian funding for the Venezuelan regional crisis. So I want to acknowledge that. And want to maybe, maybe take us ahead a little bit. Um, how do you see the crisis evolving in the medium and longer term? And specifically, can you speak a bit about what the U.S. government is prepared to do to address the needs of the displaced population both now and also in, in Venezuela as well as in those receiving countries? And then further in the conversation, we'll get into the road ahead over the medium and long term. Thank you, thank you very much for your question. And thank you again for the Atlantic Council for having this event and trying to bring to light of what's going on here. It's extremely important and we're very grateful for you doing this. I want to pick up where Ambassador Vecchio left off, kind of one of the premises of your question, the, the aspect of long term. There cannot and must not be any acceptable long term with Maduro in power. The civilized world cannot accept what is going on now as a status quo. Uh, as far as um, you know, the numbers, you said before that we all know the numbers. It's worth repeating the numbers again to remember the scale. As of August, the UN estimates that 4.3 million Venezuelans have left Venezuela now, mm -hmm. uh, with 3.5 million alone in Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, the UN projects that the number of Venezuelans could reach 5 million by the end of this year. Since FY7, uh, 2017, the United States has provided nearly $377 million to help provide basic necessities, things like food, water, medicine, safety, to Venezuelans who have fled this man-made crisis in their country and the communities that, hosting, that are hosting them. That's important to remember. In the short and medium term, we have to appreciate the impact that these populations of displaced Venezuelans have in their host countries and communities. That's why the U.S. government is also assist capacity building in exactly those host countries and communities that are providing food, shelter, medicine, and safety to these innocent <coughs> Venezuelans who have had to flee the nightmare of Nicolas Maduro. Um, but while humanitarian aid helps alleviate the immediate needs of any Venezuelans, it does not address the root causes of Venezuela's instability. Only political and economic reforms will end the hyperinflation, supply shortages, and corruption at the heart of this crisis. As long as the corrupt Maduro regime continues to cling to power and enrich itself at the expense of the Venezuelan people, the, need, the needs in the country will only grow, death and misery will continue, and more and more people will be forced to flee, further straining the region's resources. It's one thing worth remembering. We have to understand, this is not a leftist political regime. It is a band of corrupt thugs who have hijacked their own country to enrich themselves through their corruption, their illicit businesses, and preying upon their own people. In the long term, no solution can take root until the current regime is gone. The regime must leave in order for Venezuelans to start rebuilding the country. The interim government is doing a great job in pressuring, preparing for recovering their country, and we, the international community, must be ready to continue supporting them. So thank you for that. I'm going to pivot to, uh, to, the, to the role of the broader international community as part of this response to the Western Hemisphere's worst humanitarian and migration crisis in recent history. Given the scale of the humanitarian crisis and the regional impacts, it's becoming clear that there's a growing need for coordinated response uh, by that international community. So Secretary, uh, State Secretary de la Iglesia, I'm going to direct this question to you. Can you speak a bit about the outcomes of a recent, the recent meeting between the Spanish Foreign Minister Borrell and the, the Colombian Foreign Minister Holmes Trujillo, who will be joining us uh, shortly, uh, to discuss the bilateral cooperation and support for the migrants fleeing Venezuela? Well, thank you, Paula, and uh, thank you very much to the Atlantic uh, Council for inviting me to share this time with you. Um, we, <coughs> Colombia and Spain, uh, we do have a very, very close and very uh, large spectrum uh, relations uh, that now go through a very well, very good moment. 
And uh, so we don't take much time to review that uh, bilateral relations. We like to uh, qualify as uh, strategic ones, but we talk very much about the situation of migrant, um, Venezuelan migrants in, uh, in Colombia. And I take the opportunity to uh, really commend the tremendous effort and uh, the extremely good way in which Colombia is facing the, the challenges that this situation uh, poses. Uh, in fact, with uh, practically the same amount of resources, they are trying to provide uh, public uh, services, uh, um, I mean, uh, health, uh, education, to, use, to that new 1.4 million Venezuelan people which are now living, and all the rest of that crossing through the country and going to uh, different, I mean, other, other countries in, uh, in uh, Latin America. So I am, we were very impressed, in fact, by uh, the way in the, uh, the sustained uh, willingness to continue to do so. I would uh, underline that uh, they are still with the doors fully open to the entry of new migrants. And uh, they are um, trying to push the Quito uh, group so that the, uh, the reception conditions could be uh, well agreed among all the countries that are also facing in a different scale uh, that, uh, the burden of new, new uh, Venezuelan migrants. So that was the, the point uh, we talked about uh, mainly. And uh, apart from recognizing the uh, excellent the example, the global example that Colombia is uh, giving to the world, that um, point, we also recognize that uh, well, the prospects are not good. And the figures, uh, the minister is coming uh, better than he explained the figures to me, uh, but the figures are really uh, present a uh, very dark um, near future prospects. And uh, we agreed that uh, it's uh, certainly a crisis which is underfunded. And uh, we also agreed that um, the, um, the implication of uh, UN has been uh, much less than expected. No? A crisis which is perfectly, can, can, can be identified as it has already been done here, as uh, the second biggest crisis of migrants in the world today well, should have uh, attract more attention in the part of uh, the, in not only the international community, we can speak about that uh, later, but about the, the, the system of the UN, no? the idea of creating this mixed uh, body with uh, ACNUR and uh, International uh, Migrations Organization uh, really has not been enough uh, to, and has not been, I mean, uh, quick enough to, to react and to deliver. The appeal made was, uh, sorry, the appeal made was only founded in a 30, about 30 and 35%. And so no institutions uh, clearly uh, with the capacity to deliver, uh, no money to fit the, the engine. So uh, we are rather surprised to see that uh, that crisis has not attracted uh, they needed and they deserve attention in the part of the, of the system of the UN. So we'll talk a bit more about that, but I do want to turn to, to Ambassador Haddad. Could you speak a little bit about the steps uh, that the, the European Union is planning on taking and commitments uh, that they are prepared to make to mobilize additional assistance precisely to that point? Uh, we all recognize that, the, that there's a there's a sizable gap between uh, the scale of the need and the number of resources that have been mobilized to date. Uh, and so again, coming back to the same theme, we all need to do more. So we would love to hear your thoughts where the European Union is and uh, what more you are you're prepared to do. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for inviting us. And uh, I think it's a very important moment when we speak about Venezuela here in, in this week uh, when the presidents are gathering at the UN. You have heard one of our member states, the EU has still 28, so I'm representing the 28, but with the present and under control of one of them, which is the pleasure to be here with you, uh, without any doubt. Uh, so we have heard the numbers, uh, they are terrifying, of course. Uh, um, 
but the problem is, of course, that uh, it stays in the continent. Uh, and we think uh, it's very important to call the attention. That's why Federica Mogherini, the High Representative, agreed with the representative of IOM and UNHCR to organize a conference uh, to speed it up um, a bit. That what the uh, Quito group wanted to do in uh, December. And uh, not only looking at the terrific situation and abuses of human rights and calling for the new establishing of rule of law in, uh, in Venezuela, we really wish to contribute to these terrific situations. So in this moment, uh, the international contact group is sitting and planning what will be the response. And uh, we are planning the conference. Uh, the conference will take place in uh, Brussels, the 28th and 29th of October. Um, and we plan two parts. One part will be assessment of the needs and the second part, uh, a pledging conference, because we see that uh, first, uh, it is very important to see what are the priorities uh, for the countries which are the recipients uh, of the migrants and thank to everybody who helps. Uh, I have to say that the European Union also is a rep recipient and the Venezuelans are the third nation in asylum application in the European Union for now. Imagine how high numbers are, it's, and it's not only Spain uh, who is receiving, uh, receiving the migrants. Maybe one point which is also important is uh, don't forget that the European Union is a direct neighbor of Venezuela. Uh, with all the islands uh, which are in the Caribbean, uh, from our member states, and we have also, it's needed to say, many European Union citizens living in Venezuela, so that's also why we are so preoccupied about the situation, and without any doubt, the danger for all the Colombia peace process where the European Union so, was so, so much engaged in the past. Thank you. So I was going to get, come to it later, but since you've opened the door, I'm going to I'm going to keep going down down the seat <coughs> of, the, of the donor conference. Uh, I did want to ask uh, both of you if you could speak a bit. Obviously, you're coming off of living your own uh, humanitarian uh, crisis, migration crisis in Europe. Um, are there lessons learned from that experience uh, of of receiving uh, those migrants in Europe that are really informing your approach and your thinking, both related to the donor conference and more broadly? Uh, your thinking regarding how to engage and how to support those neighboring countries, which, as, as you rightly pointed out, includes yourselves uh, in the Caribbean. But how is that informing your, your thinking in terms of the planning moving forward? Well, uh, I'm, not, I'm, I'm really not an expert on immigration uh, questions. But I tend to think that uh, there, are, there are rather different ones. Our experience mm -hmm. uh, strictly economic, uh, and clearly political on one side, and the situation which is prevailing in, uh, in Venezuela with the uh, um, Venezuelan uh, migrants. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, we, we have developed ways and means to, to share that, uh, that experience, even though I, I insist the situations, the, um, the, the real situations on the ground is quite uh, different. We have um, asked uh, to be considered observers at the Quito Group, and we have bilateral develop, and um, I'm sure that the Union is doing the same in their programs, uh, develop ways to share that uh, experience we have in, the, uh, in all the areas of administrative uh, management of uh, people which has migrated. But I, I don't know if I have the time now. There is, there is a very, I mean, a very important difference uh, between both crises. No? Uh, in, uh, in the Syrian crisis, uh, the political track and the migrations are two completely separated tracks, which make much more easy to apply the principles of the humanitarian action. Uh, in, uh, in Venezuela, the tracks are more uh, confused, more linked and uh, that makes it much more difficult to organize a, a really huge humanitarian action according to the principles of the humanitarian action, the neutrality, impartiality, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. So I think that that point it makes quite a difference between those 
these two situations. Sorry to be late. Yes, um, yeah, the European Union, of course, we have our special DG, Director General, who takes care about the humanitarian issues, DG ECHO. Um, they are also present here in New York and they are giving some uh, replies to your questions in, in these days here. Uh, we already had supplied, prepared 150 million euros for the Venezuelan crisis. It's a huge amount of money comparing to other uh, humanitarian crises, what, the money what we are spending as European Union. And we are looking at three points mainly. Is the security first? health and food, not only outside Venezuela, but also inside Venezuela. It's more or less 60% for inside, 40% for outside in these moments, but it also can change and we hope that through the conference we can gain more money from other donors to see uh, where we can, uh, the best way, um, place this money and it could be useful. I think health is a very important issue, especially for women and kids. And of course, everything what has linked with uh, gender-based violence also, this is something where we will um, really focus uh, our help uh, from the European Union. Looking at the two main sources for the migrants from the European Union, as you said, it's a very different to look to Syria and to look down uh, to the African countries. And the approach is also different. And of course, in many cases, about, it's about the root causes, working with the governments to prevent the people to leave. It is a different situation here. Unfortunately, we are not so able to work with the regime. Um, the humanitarian aid is not allowed so much to come into the country. There are certain conditions and we are trying also, of course, as European Union to communicate with the regime and to try to get at least the food and medicines inside. So I want to go back to something that we touched on before uh, regarding the UN uh, and the scale of the UN response and efforts to scale uh, that response. So we've talked about some of the steps the US, the EU, Spain have taken to date and more broadly the international community. But of course, the crisis continues to worsen and the need for assistance continues to grow. Um, the scale of the international response doesn't match the depth and breadth of the crisis, as we've discussed. Um, and I just want to just put a, a finer point on that. Um, the UN recently re re uh, released the 2019 Humanitarian Response Plan in, in August, which appealed for an additional $223 million, um, as the ambassador has alluded to, which will assist 2.6 million people living in Venezuela just for the months of July through December of this year. Mm -hmm. All the while, the, the UN acknowledges that the Venezuelan crisis goes well beyond that. And as the ambassador has referenced, uh, the number of people in need in Venezuela is actually closer to 7 million. Um, so the numbers are daunting, uh, and it's clear that we must do more. So Assistant Administrator, I want to turn to you. The US has historically played a central role in mobilizing the international community's resources and calling the world to action to solve some of the toughest uh, challenges and crises uh, facing the world. What's your message? What's the message of the United States government to the international community at this time as you look at the urgent needs and the growing needs uh, in Venezuela, as well as the longer term needs uh, the region uh, will face? Well, thank you very much. Um, I was just in Colombia and Ecuador a few weeks ago, and I was able to meet with Venezuelans who had fled just days prior and months prior. Um, and I can, have, I can tell you, holding the hand of a woman who had fled Venezuela just 48 hours prior. She's sitting in a hospital at Cúcuta. She received no prenatal care in Venezuela, scared for her health and the health of her baby. She's holding my hand. The first things coming out of her mouth was not, how's the conference planning going? Um, the conferences are important, don't get me wrong. So the US certainly supports those actions. Um, we applaud the international community coming in together. Uh, we're on the ground right now helping out, doing what we can uh, for the Venezuelans with humanitarian assistance and helping with capacity building in these receptor countries and communities that are um, dealing with the crisis. The message is, again, the civilized world cannot and must not accept a situation. Dealing with the regime to address the root causes of the migratory problem is rather awkward when the regime itself is the root cause. The hemisphere has never seen human suffering on such a staggering level. The international community cannot turn a blind eye 
to this human tragedy. In Venezuela right now, humanitarian access remains constrained. Nicolas Maduro has only allowed a minuscule amount of aid to be provided at, the, at, at a scale, you know, not at a scale commensurate with the needs in Venezuela, and has made it extremely diff difficult for international NGOs to register to do their work. Uh, this, coupled with security concerns, makes it difficult for humanitarian organizations to respond on a scale commensurate with the enormous need created by this man-made crisis. <clears throat> Only a government that really cares about the well-being of its people will, with the help of the international community, be able to start restoring the systems to fulfill the Venezuelans' fundamental rights to adequate, adequate food and health services. The regime has neither the means or desire to do it. And in fact, it uses food as a social and political control mechanism. Having met with people who had just fled, talking about the famous clap boxes and even distribution, this myth has to be dispelled you know, using humanitarian aid for political purposes. This is not a regime we can work with. So thank you for that. I want to stay on the point of where are the gaps, and, and Ambassador Dowd, you referenced this a bit about part of the initial effort going into the conference is identifying where are the greatest needs, where are the greatest gaps, either in terms of the system that's in place and the response that's been un un unveiled and implemented to date. Um, so I want to turn to you, Ambassador, maybe you could speak a, a bit more because I think it's important because I think, again, the human aspect of the suffering I think is critical. Um, and I think yeah. we've heard food, we've heard health, but I think if you could speak a bit more about what are some of those uh, urgent needs. And again, I think the UN system um, has, a, has really worked hard to try to ramp up and scale up its response. Again, a big part of that will rely on the international community to step up to the plate and actually answer those calls. I think if you could speak a little bit more, put a finer point on what are some of those critical issues where you see the greatest gaps, and, and if you could, if I could go a leap a, a bit further and go, you know, where do you see the gaps? Do you see the gaps as um, distribution gaps? Do you see the gaps in terms of funding gaps? Where do you see, again, the greatest opportunity for, for increased action? Uh, yes, I mean, that's a good point, but uh, I don't wanna uh, just move uh, the point where it should be. Mm -hmm. In my view, we need to attack the root of the problem, mm -hmm. which, which is uh, the regime who <laughs> has created this situation. So let me give you this context as well. Uh, recently, uh, the interim president, Juan Guaido, was involved in a negotiation with uh, Norway as a country, you know, as a mediator with the regime. Mm -hmm. We were looking for a political solution inside of Venezuela mm -hmm. to stop the suffering mm -hmm. right away, you know, from the roots. And, and the regime decided to abandon that process mm -hmm. and we closed it. We presented a political solution to all Venezuelans to resolve the crisis. President uh, Juan Guaido put on the table a, a sort of a state council, a, a, Consejo de Estado, in order to create a national unity government to conduct a transition while we organized a fair and a transparent election uh, within the observation of the international uh, community. And they didn't want to go uh, to, to that option. I mean, we are blaming Maduro for closing a political solution uh, in order to stop the suffering of the Venezuela. And the international com community should blame Maduro because of this. We presented a fair and a transparent solution to resolve the humanitarian crisis. Yep. So this is the time to increase the pressure for the international community. That's why we are you know, asking the international community. We have the majority of the Venezuelans. And that, that's why I'm fully confident that we will pre prevail at the end of the day. We have the majority of the people of Venezuela with that spirit of change. We have the clear leadership of Juan Guaido we will mobilize the people in order to conquer freedom again and to stop the suffering of the Venezuela, but for that we need to, the support of the international community. So my key message for the international community is to increase the pressure to create the condition to facilitate a transition in our country. <clears throat> in terms of the suffering of the Venezuela, I mean, I have to thank the international community for the support that we have received from, from many countries, including the U.S. I mean, the U.S. has granted more than 300 million to the Venezuelans you know, to the countries, to the international organization, to alleviate the suffering of the Venezuela. Uh, and they have sent uh, in two times uh, the comfort uh, ship to Latin America to attend the people of Venezuela who are in those countries. 
So we want to thank because of that and also the Europeans and, and the main Latin American countries. But it's not enough. It's not enough. Uh, again, I will highlight the, the following. The UN said that more than 7 million people inside of Venezuela need help, vital assistance to keep them alive. So the UN is not ready for that. They said that they can only cover 2.6. So my message here is that we need to increase that. We need to increase that inside of Venezuela, inside of Venezuela. And the other one, which is the refugee crisis outside of Venezuela, Venezuelans who are you know, across uh, the continent, across the, this hemisphere, uh, we have close to 4.5 million uh, Venezuela outside of our country. It could reach up to 5.5 at the end of this year. And if we compare that crisis with the Syria refugee crisis, I mean, we're far away. I mean, the, the international community has granted more than three, uh, three, 30,000 million to the Syria crisis, instead to the Venezuela has been very low. And they have allocated to the Syria refugee, each person, $5,000. 5,000 instead, in the case of Venezuela, doesn't reach $300 uh, per person. So these are the gaps that we have inside of Venezuela and outside of Venezuela. And my message to the international community, this is the right time to work in the political solution in the long run, to resolve it immediately. But at the same time, while we conquer freedom again, we need to alleviate the suffering of the Venezuela who are inside of our country and also Venezuelans who are abroad. So, we need to take advantage of this uh, 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 National uh, General Assembly here in the, UN, in the UN to highlight that this, the magnitude of this crisis is similar to the magnitude of other crises that have received more support, so that ha now has to be addressed in a different manner to alleviate the suffering of the Venezuelans. Thank you for that message. Crystal clear, I think we all hear it loud and clear, and I think you've got in this room uh, a committed uh, and loyal uh, constituents who will take that message um, and are prepared to actually take action to go along with that recognition of that message. I do want to latch on to one point that you made regarding um, the migrants who have fled Venezuela, because I think, I think we need to address absolutely uh, the needs of the, the, the Venezuelan people who are suffering in Venezuela. I think we also, as an international community, need to maintain a focus on the region. Uh, over the long term, because I think, uh, as, as we've discussed at length at, at a variety of other venues, um, the crisis, even if it will resolve tomorrow, yes. it will take some time uh, for the reconstruction of the country. Uh, it will take some time to reestablish the institutions, um, the full functioning of those institutions to deliver on the needs uh, of the Venezuelan people. Uh, and so I think, I don't want to lose the thread of Everyone, even if this were solved tomorrow, we'll inshallah, um, everyone will not return tomorrow. And so these countries will continue to have these migrants in their respective countries for some time. And I think as we think about that next generation of Venezuelans of varying ages that are now in neighboring countries, we need to think about their needs in terms of health, education, and make sure we don't lose a whole generation that will actually mm -hmm. be critical to that reconstruction of your country. So, so maybe I'll open that up uh, to all of you, but maybe start with you, Assistant Administrator. Obviously, at USAID, you do a tremendous amount looking at the medium and long-term development assistance. I know you're already planning for it. Um, would love to hear your thoughts. We're not just planning for it, we're doing it. So um, I, as I mentioned, I was just, um, I just returned a couple weeks ago from Ecuador and Colombia. So w we have to applaud um, the Duke administration, what they're doing in terms of support for these Venezuelan populations. So USAID is proud, and, and others in the U.S. government, we're proud of our support, not only humanitarian assistance for those Venezuelans themselves, but for the Colombians in terms of capacity building. I mentioned I was at a hospital um, in Cúcuta, uh, a hospital Erasmo Meos. It's the largest hospital in Cúcuta. It's a five-minute drive from the bridge that everybody's seen. So what USAID did, I, I was extremely proud to be part of a ribbon-cutting ceremony for uh, additional facilities in that hospital to help deal with the additional burden, you know, placed you know, on it by the fleeing Venezuelans. It, again, I mentioned the wo uh, the woman I met who was pregnant. This isn't it? FYI, um, about 97 percent of all pregnant women who are fleeing Venezuela have received no prenatal care, which by definition makes them high risk pregnancies. So since 20, uh, 2015. 
that hospital right on the border of Gugata has seen birth rates go up over 4,000%. So that's just one example. So you have caminantes, who they are, they're not just in the border communities, these are Venezuelans who go to Ecuador, Peru. I met with uh, representatives from the Chilean government. There's a huge population. So what we are doing, and we certainly welcome the international community to join us, is to help the capacity building in these receptor communities. Because again, um, inshallah, the whole uh, Maduro will be gone soon enough, but yeah, it will not be a binary light switch where everybody comes back immediately. So we have to help these hosts um, countries and communities with their capacity. I'm going to give you an opportunity if you, if you want to weigh in. Otherwise, I'm going to give Ambassador Vicky, I'm going to give you the final word before we close well, out this I panel. I would say, I mean, you, the, your point that you raised is quite important. We need to be uh, ready for the future as well. We have been working inside of the interim government of Venezuela uh, to be ready by the moment we take full control of the government in our country. And we have built like Plan Pais with a lot of experts and, and, and people inside of Venezuela, outside of Venezuela, and with many countries and private companies also, we have been working with them in order to develop a plan to recover Venezuela in all sectors. And, and, and this plan has been supported by all political parties inside of Venezuela, so it will bring stability to our country. Um, and we need to be just ready for that. As, as we are just uh, working in order to conquer freedom, at the same time, we need to work with the international community in a plan to recover Venezuela because this crisis will, will stay you know, a little bit longer. However, I think we are ready to create the conditions for the return of many Venezuelans and many companies and many people inside of our country to rebuild uh, Venezuela. Uh, uh, and these uh, plans uh, at least has uh, three main ideas. One is uh, bringing political stability, a democratic system inside of Venezuela, rural, rural of law, separation of power is the only way to create political stability. We believe in that. We believe in political pluralism, and, and that, that will help to, to um, facilitate the process to open our economy uh, and, and, and work with the private sector to facilitate you know, the, the, the boost of our economy. Of course, we will use the oil sector as an engine to restart our economy, but also from the social point of view. And again, this is quite important to bring uh, social stability as well. Uh, this is about the people. We are doing this because of the people. Um, we have 94% of poverty inside of Venezuela. Uh, and if we want to have a, a, a great country, we need to take that into account. We need to po uh, put those people in the same starting line in order to take advantages of the uh, economic opportunities that we will create. Those, this will be also part of our plan. But for that, we will need the support of the international community in the long run. Thank you, Ambassador Vecchio, for those closing remarks. And with that, uh, please join me in thanking our distinguished panelists, Ambassador Vecchio, Secretary de la Iglesia, Ambassador Harda, and Assistant Administrator Barca. Thank you. Thanks. With that, it's my distinct pleasure to invite my colleague, Diego Area, who's an associate director at the Adrian Arsh Latin America Center, uh, to the stage. Diego, please. Thank you very much, Paula, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Every day, when we open a newspaper, or where we turn on the TV, even when we check on our social media accounts, we come across shocking statistics about the Venezuelan immense crisis that we're facing. But what we don't see and what's harder to understand is, are the stories around those statistics, the day-to-day -day struggles, the human impact, the suffering of millions. What those stories also show us and teaches us is what it means to be resilient in the face of hardship. Today, we will hear from a handful of Venezuelans in Peru who have managed to do so much with so little, the very definition of resilience. They will share their own unique and inspiring stories. Like Venezuelan 
National Assembly Representative Juan Recrescens said, before being imprisoned by the Maduro regime, yo me niego a rendirme. I refuse to give up. My friend Juan Requesens, the people on this video, and millions of Venezuelans haven't given up. It's my hope today that you all and the entire international community won't give up either. It is my pleasure to introduce Carlos Escul, Venezuelan ambassador in Peru, that will give us, that will tell us a lot of stories of shocking situation that they are facing, but also the magic resilience that our people is providing to the countries in the region. Thank you so much. Imaginas perder a tu familia, tus hijos, tu empleo, tus ahorros, tus conocidos, tu acreditación académica, tu identidad. Esta es la situación hoy de más de 869 mil migrantes venezolanos que han llegado al Perú desde 2016. Muchos han tenido que reinventarse. Es por ello que la Embajada de la República de Venezuela en Perú ha diseñado el Plan de Apoyo Estratégico al Connacional. En conjunto con importantes actores de la cooperación internacional y nacional que nos han ayudado a poner en práctica estas líneas estratégicas para asistir a los venezolanos en el país. Como la representación legítima del Estado venezolano, estamos trabajando en proyectos para ayudar a todos los migrantes que han llegado a Perú. Es por eso que estamos trabajando en varios proyectos conjuntamente con la cooperación internacional, actores y organizaciones para apoyar a la comunidad venezolana en este país. Muchos han dejado atrás sus sueños, sus esperanzas, pero no han dejado atrás esa aspiración que tienen de salir adelante. Estamos trabajando en varios proyectos como Benemprende y Valiosos para apoyar a los venezolanos a que puedan buscar sus sueños en este país. El caso de Benemprende es un programa que busca apoyar a emprendedores venezolanos a formalizarse, a crear su idea de negocio y así poder insertarse en el mundo laboral en el Perú, apoyar la economía y por supuesto no solo a tener sino a dar empleo. Y en valiosos.org buscamos conectar el capital privado, la empresa privada con el capital humano venezolano y así ellos pueden buscar empleo y buscar ese trabajo que tanto quieren y necesitan y es la primera bolsa de empleo para venezolanos en el Perú. Son proyectos que se pueden replicar en toda la región y de aquí en la Embajada de Venezuela vamos a seguir trabajando por la inserción laboral y para apoyar a todos los venezolanos en Perú. Llegué a Lima hace un año y seis meses porque debido a la situación que se enfrenta en nuestro país decidimos emigrar. Nosotros venimos de la región zuliana, de donde se come el plátano, de donde todo lo acompañamos con el plátano y en base a eso pues generamos una idea de negocio que la vimos, aprovechamos la oportunidad de que este país que es rico gastronómicamente, todos los ingredientes se consiguen en crear una, un, una idea de negocio. Esta idea de negocio consiste en preparar platos con el ingrediente principal que es el plátano, desde las empanadas, el patacón, hacemos también lasaña de plátano, es por ello que queremos eh, llenar de sabor como nosotros lo hacíamos en nuestro país al pueblo peruano. Yo soy consultor de software, eh, llegué con una empresa que me contrató aquí eh, y me trajo desde Venezuela para acá, para Perú. Mi idea de negocio es un proyecto en el cual eh, puede involucrar personas, que ayuden muchas personas y que realmente sea de vanguardia. El programa es muy importante porque ayuda a llevar un enfoque, a, a, a tener una orientación a aquellas personas que queremos emprender y a veces no, no sabemos cómo. Y me emprenden, ayuda a todos estos emprendedores. Creo que sería un proyecto de, para beneficio no solamente del Perú, sino de Latinoamérica, porque necesitamos más empresas, eh, más microempresas que poco a poco puedan crecer y llegar a competir con los grandes en el mercado. Yo soy casada con peruanos, entonces llegué como residente. Mi idea de negocio, de hecho, ya está funcionando. Ya no es tanto idea, ya yo he dado los primeros pasos. Es la eh, pintura sobre porcelana para la elaboración de homenaje 
para restaurantes, hoteles y para viviendas, para, para personas, para casas. La información para el emprendedor siempre es muy importante, hasta de la actividad de coach ha sido importante. El emprendedor, el emprendedor siempre es muy seguro, siempre es inseguro, siempre tiene cositas por allí que, que están débiles y el programa pues está ayudando a fortalecer esas, esas, esas cosas que no, no sentimos tan bien. Hay muchísima gente además que me pregunta qué tal me está yendo y que quieren participar. Yo llegué aquí hace un año y medio ya, me vine con toda mi familia, con mi hijo que tiene tres años hoy en día y mi esposa que actualmente está embarazada. Me vine buscando un sueño, un futuro para mi familia y tratar de salir de, de todos esos problemas que estaba viviendo en mi país. La idea de negocio se llama Tequechis. Son elaboración de tequeños, una fábrica de tequeños venezolanos que ya contamos con toda la permisología correspondiente, registro sanitario, marcas registradas y nuestra misión, o nuestra visión es colocar nuestro producto en todos los supermercados de de, de este país. Sería bastante beneficioso para nosotros los emprendedores poder contar en, en cada sitio, en cada país donde nos encontremos con un programa como este para poder ser apoyado en esta difícil tarea que es emprender y aún más difícil emprender en un país que no es el tuyo. Como todos los venezolanos, pues estamos acá buscando una oportunidad, una oportunidad este, de crecer, de de aprender y bueno, de, de poder tener una mejor calidad de vida realmente. Con una maleta llena de ilusiones, de esperanzas, de sueños, eh, con mucha fe. Mi idea de negocio es una crema eh, de pisco, es como un ponche crema venezolano, el tradicional ponche crema venezolano, pero está fusionado con pisco. Un ponche crema tipo una crema de licor. Actualmente este, ya tengo el, el producto en el mercado y tengo el sabor tradicional que es el de leche, mocachino, chocolate, coco y sublime blanco y algarrobina. Tengo ya un año con el emprendimiento y estas tres semanas han sido fenomenales porque me han hecho ubicarme y me han hecho aprender porque esto ha sido como un ensayo y error, por lo menos es mi experiencia. Acá he aprendido a, a tener ya una idea más clara, más precisa de lo que es el negocio, de a dónde quiero llegar, qué quiero lograr qué es lo que busco realmente, entonces de verdad que es una iniciativa excelente yo en lo particular estoy muy agradecida porque me ha orientado eh, enormemente pues. y así como nos están dando esta oportunidad a nosotros que somos digamos que la primera promoción pues deberían de dársela a muchísima más gente este, que estoy segura que hay muchos buenos proyectos porque como digo siempre los venezolanos no restamos, sumamos y indudablemente somos más Benemprende ha sido un eh, programa muy importante en el desarrollo de los venezolanos emprendedores acá en el Perú porque les brinda los conocimientos eh, necesarios para poder desarrollar planes de negocio y poder entender el, el mercado como tal peruano. Eh, nosotros desde Lima Emprende precisamente promovemos lo que es la integración de los venezolanos con el mercado peruano y el entendimiento de cómo funcionan las estrategias de negocio y a través de Ben Emprende eh, lo que hemos venido haciendo es fortalecer todo ese entendimiento a través de todos los talleres de formación. That we are here to help. I'm Jason Marzak, the director of the Adrian Ars Latin America Center, and I'm delighted to welcome to the stage uh, the Foreign Minister of Colombia, Carlos Omis Trujillo. Welcome, Minister, and the Special Envoy for Foreign Affairs of the Interim Government of Venezuela, uh, Julio Borges. Welcome, welcome to you both. Thank you. Uh, Minister Trujillo is now almost one year on the job, uh, actually just over just over a year on the job and has an illustrious career uh, before being named to this post. He served as ambassador to the EU, Organization of American States, as well as Russia, Iceland, and Austria. Uh, we are also, th this, this event is about Priority Venezuela. It's also a birthday party for the foreign minister. Today is his birthday. Congratulations, <laughs> uh, Mr. Minister. Feliz cumpleaños. Thank you. And Julio Borges is the, was first elected to the National Assembly uh, in, in the year 2000. He served uh, since January of this year as the ambassador of Venezuela to the Lima Group. And for the last, now just nearly one month, as the special envoy for foreign affairs, uh, congratulations on this Thank new, you. very well-deserved post, Julio. Thank you. Uh, thank you both for your time and your leadership. What we're going to do is this, this panel, this next discussion, the next half hour, is really about fo further focusing on the need for more global support 
uh, for for uh, for Venezuela and because and for the and for the Venezuelans uh, and the countries that are bearing uh, some some of the many Venezuelans who who have left. Uh, Mr. Trujillo, I want to start with you. Um, Colombia is the country outside of Venezuela most affected uh, by the Venezuela crisis. Um, more than 1.4 million Venezuelans as of June uh, were living <coughs> in, in Colombia. Uh, I, I saw the, the recent numbers from the Colombian migration authorities uh, expecting potentially up to 2.5 million Venezuelans in a moderate scenario uh, uh, by, by year end. And, and this is really an unprecedented wave of migrants and, and refugees. We just saw the video of a video of Venezuelans who are living in Peru, but I'd like to take this moment here as world leaders meet only a few minutes away uh, to discuss during this important week the Colombian government's policy of complete, complete solidarity uh, toward Venezuelan migrants and refugees, providing medical care, housing, public education, work permits, even granting nationality to 24,000 children born to Venezuelan parents in Colombian territory. Mister, what are the short and medium-term needs for Colombia to continue this far-reaching policy of welcoming for Venezuelans? Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. <clears throat> Good afternoon to everyone. Well, this is a huge challenge for us. Since the beginning of President Duque's administration, we pointed out to the world and to the Colombian public opinion that the migration issue was not a Colombian issue, but a regional issue with a global impact. And that is why the first thing we did was reaching out to the region, telling our colleagues that it is important to harmonize migration measures in our region. And that is why we helped so much to put in motion what is called as the Quito process. And secondly, we, went, we came immediately to the United Nations and told the Secretary General, Mr. Secretary, we are going through a humanitarian tsunami. I, it, took, it took me one second to tell him that and asked for the appointment of a high envoy, which actually he did. And that is why Dr. Eduardo Stein, a former Vice President of Guatemala, is helping us. Besides that, we put in motion a public policy internally. We went to the Council, Council of Ministers, headed by the President himself, and a public policy was decided. There are resources that are, has been assigned from the national level, regional level, local level, and we have been asking the international community to help us a lot. What is the situation now? The situation is that the number of migrants coming into Colombia is increasing every second. And this is not an exaggeration. Every second there is a new Venezuelan coming into Colombia. Every second there is a Venezuelan coming and asking for some service, health services, education services, and some other services. So we are very grateful because of the support of the international community. We are very grateful with the United States very grateful with the European Union, with other countries that are helping us a lot, but we need more cooperation and more help. Let's take a look at the figures. This is the second largest in number so far, yep. migration crisis. First is Syrian crisis, 6.7 million Syrians out of their country. In this case, 4.3 million. And the number is increasing and increasing and increasing every day. How is the volume of resources that has been assigned by the international community in order to help recipient countries to handle this huge, huge, huge crisis. There was an international call launched jointly by the organization, International Organization for Migration and the Office of the High Commissioner for Refugees to get 740 million US dollars. As of today, less than 30% has been collected. But let's take a look at another comparison. A migrant from Syria is receiving $560 per capita. A migrant from Venezuela is getting 68.18 cents. You can see the difference. If we were to receive the amount of support that Syria has received, Syrians have received, we would have received seven billion US dollars. I'm not asking for that figure. What I'm saying is that we need more. The situation is too challenged for us. We are doing everything we can, and we will keep on maintaining the same policy, humanitarian sense, solidarity sense, 
and a sense of historical gratitude. But the magnitude of the crisis goes beyond our capacity to face the crisis. So this is the call that I want to make here today, not without repeating, without saying again that we are very grateful because of the support that we are receiving from the United States. And, and Minister, that, that call from the United, that, that was almost a year ago that that call went out for $740 million. No. And, in, and in, in the last year, just, just as you said, 30, about 30%. A little bit less than that. A little bit less than 30%. Yeah. 30% uh, ast astronomical numbers. And again, an important moment as world, as world leaders gathering here in New York, that this needs to be a focus of not, this is not just a Latin America issue, this is a global issue. Uh, uh, Special Envoy Borges, uh, in addition to the needs of, of Venezuelan migrants and refugees who have left the country, as talked about in the last panel, and Ambassador Vecchi was mentioning the, the needs for Venezuelans inside of Venezuela as well. What are, the most, what are those most immediate needs, and what is your call for the international community? Well, thank you, and feliz cumpleaños, canciller. Gracias. <laughs> thank you. And, uh, well, I'm one of those Venezuelans that has been in Colombia looking for help and receiving help from Colombia. And thank you for all the support of Colombia in the case of Venezuela. Well, inside Venezuela, what we really need is to put an end on Maduro regime. There's no other way. If we talk about anything else, that would be a mistake. Uh, we have tried to create different programs in order to provide humanitarian help within Venezuela. That has been impossible. We have been talking about humanitarian help within Venezuela since six years ago, and the regime has been totally closed uh, for political reasons to be open for humanitarian help. help. And uh, I really think that we have, that's one of the reasons we have to uh, build more pressure in order to create an, an internal division and, and, and a final outcome in the case of Venezuela. And I really believe that we are in a very crucial moment uh, regarding what could be the end of the dictatorship in Venezuela. And uh, I really uh, think that the path that we have followed this year has been successful. I've seen that pressure has made a very important damage within the dictatorship, and we have to increase uh, that internal pressure. I, I, I have two points that could, uh, can be useful as an example. Mm -hmm. I'm really convinced that there is a real division between the army force and Maduro's regime. Uh, this division is impossible to, to find a way for Maduro to, to join and to make closer the army force for him. And also, we receive every day different signals from people from the army force and very high people from the dictatorship looking for a way out and different kind of negotiation in order to produce an outcome in Venezuela. And I really believe that pressure has been uh, a success and we have to keep that path in order to, to really obtain a victory in the case of Venezuela. And, and, and following up on that, uh, what is your aspiration for this week? Uh, your aspiration as world leaders are gathering, uh, this is, as you mentioned, uh, Special Envoy Borges, this is a critical moment to ratchet up the pressure yeah. on Nicolas Maduro. We cannot solve the suffering of the Venezuelan people. Uh, we, we can't uh, uh, help to reduce the number of migrants and refugees going to uh, Colombia and, and going across the region with Nicolas Maduro in power? Well, we're in a crucial moment for two reasons. First of all, and that's had to do with Colombia, uh, the international community thought that we are fighting to a dictatorship. But then people has become to realize that it is not a, a dictatorship, it's a failed state. But most recently, people is aware that we are fighting against a criminal state. A criminal state that is protecting terrorism, drug traffic, and all of kinds of uh, violent groups within Venezuela. And this is a huge change that has happened uh, a month ago with the, these narco-terrorist groups start talking in Venezuela about being loyal to Venezuela, about being defending Venezuela, 
and Maduro is protecting them. I sent to Canciller Holmes Trujillo yesterday a poem mm. wrote by uh, Centrich. Mm. It's a poem to Maduro. I don't know if you read it, Ambassador. It was, Jesus Antri is a former FARC commander who's living in Venezuela. Yeah. yeah, and he wrote a beautiful poem about Maduro, telling that he's the new believer, and we have to fight with Maduro in order to obtain freedom for Venezuela. It can be a joke, it can be funny, but it's a sad reality. This group are completely joined with Maduro regime, and also, and this is very important, with the Cuban regime. There is no way to change Venezuela, although we understand clearly the real connection between Cuba and Maduro. The second point is that we already finished the dialogue in Barbados. Mm -hmm. And the dialogue in Barbados was finished by Maduro himself. In, in, in two opportunities, he said that he won't sit again with us he closed the opportunity. We put a very rational, democratic, and legal opportunity for, for a solution, and he said no. So what I expect this week from the United Nations is that we are starting a new chapter in which a building a new pressure, mainly from Europe, it would be crucial in order to put a final pressure on their Maduro regime. Thank you. I mean, all, all incredible good faith from the, from the part of the interim government in those negotiations in, in Barbados. And as you say, uh, no good faith uh, from, from, of course, from, from Nicolas Maduro. Exactly. Uh, Minister Trujillo, uh, uh, Special Envoy Borges mentioned the presence of Jesus Santrich, the former FARC commander uh, in, in Venezuela, which brings me to pivot, a pivot to security and a pivot to the security constraints, uh, concerning concerns faced by your country uh, because of Nicolas Maduro. Uh, the, the Maduro regime welcomes, uh, with open arms, Colombian criminal groups, uh, shelters, FARC dissidents, uh, and the National Liberation Army, the ELN, who engage in illicit gold mining, uh, run their drug trafficking out of Venezuela, and other activities. Um, it's recent documents from, from your government that there's over 1,000 ELN, um, uh, probably much higher, that are, that are currently in, in Venezuela. Um, as well, there's recently leaked documents uh, that show that the Venezuelan armed forces are providing weapons and ammunition uh, to Colombian criminal groups. And then earlier this month, Nicolas Maduro also announced he'd be sending 150,000 troops to the Colombian border. What can world leaders do, again, this week, with this renewed focus on this need, this need for renewed push and focus for, for democratic transition in Venezuela? What can world leaders do to help to protect Colombia's security and sovereignty in the face of Maduro's harboring of criminal groups intent on attacking Colombia. Several several things to be to be said. Mm, first of all, this is a great opportunity to let everybody know the immense challenge that the region is facing. Not only Colombia. Of course, we are a border country, and it is it is clear the amount of uh, risks and dangers that we are that we are facing. Secondly, this is a good chance of the international community again to be aware that the best thing that can be done is increasing the support to Juan Guaidó, to increase the international recognition to Juan Guaidó, to increase the pressure, to increase sanctions, to put even more pressure on that regime. That cannot be stopped if someone thinks that the best solution is to not to do, to keep on doing that, is going into a huge mistake. That will only help the dictatorship. That will only help Maduro. So the international community has to be aware that the immense challenge to democracy, that the immense challenge to international security, peace and stability, that the Maduro regimes put to the world as a whole has to be faced from the international perspective with more international support and more recognition to President Juan Guaidó. Secondly, by doing that, the international community will be helping not only to restore democracy in Venezuela, 
and to lead a path into more peace and stability in the world. It will be helping Colombia because the links, and you know that very well, Mike, because the links of Chavez regime a Maduro regime with narco-terrorist Colombian organizations is a long story. I had a chance recently in the Permanent Council of the Organization of American States to denounce again such a kind of links. And I remember the regional community, the story from 2002. I showed again all the evidences, all the facts, all the proofs that the international community in Colombia has about those links. And I went further in order to deal in detail with a recent development, which I am going to explain to you in more detail if you allow me to please, do so, because please go ahead. you mentioned some names. There are two guys that used to belong to the former FARC group. Those guys are named alias Santrich and alias Ivan Marquez. The guys never deliver on the commitments that they made. They never presented themselves before the special jurisdiction for peace. They never helped to know the truth. They never deliver on the commitment to repair victims. What is going on? What is going on is that one of them was filmed making a deal to export cocaine to the United States. The name is Santrich. Once he did that, the guy went to jail. Then he went out of jail. Then he went and took his post as a member of the lower house, which is one of the commitments made by the former president and FARC. And finally, the guy disappeared. So who is him? A fugitive, a guy that is investigated by links with narco trafficking a guy that left the, the left the place where he was in order not to be caught, in order not to be extradited to the United States. So the guy is a fugitive. And in the same operation, the nephew of the so himself, he called himself Ivan Marquez, was caught and is now in the United States under the status of protected witness. And he's sharing with the authorities all the links of Ivan Marquez with narco trafficking. Those two guys went out and said that they are forming a new group. That is not a new guerrilla group. It's a narco trafficking organization which has the support of the regime of Nicolás Maduro. So we are facing a new threat coming out of Venezuela, coming out of the Maduro's regime, coming out of the presence in that country because the regime has invited them to go there. That is doing a lot of harm to Colombia, is doing a lot of harm to the region, and is doing a lot of harm to democracy as a whole. So that is the situation today. What can, coming back to, to your main question, what can the international community do? Allow me to repeat that, because this has to be said and said and repeat and repeat once and again. We need more recognition to Juan Guaidó. We need more support to democratic fighters in Venezuela. We need more support to the effort, the huge effort that the Lima Group is doing. We need to strengthen the Lima Group. We need to be closer to the European Union. We need to be closer to other democracies in the world because this is a common fight. But this has to be a Latin American solution. The best thing to do is asking our friends, because they are friends and they are democracies, European democracies, to support the effort that is being done by the Lima Group. That is my answer. More support, let me tell you again, more support and more recognition to Juan Guaidó. We need more countries to recognize Guaidó. That is the only way, the only way to get to a point in which the Venezuela can live again in democracy and freedom. Thank you very much, Minister Trujillo.
Mr. I think your answer also explicitly laid out why what is happening in Venezuela is not just a Venezuela issue. It's not just a Venezuela, Colombia issue. It is not just a regional issue. It is a global issue with the international criminal tentacles of Venezuela <coughs> reaching across the world. Uh, Special Envoy Borges, as is, is, is the foreign minister just said, the Maduro regime has growing links with drug trafficking, terrorist organizations, alliances with totalitarian and dictatorial governments. Beyond these domestic and regional implications, how is the growth of this criminal enterprise in Venezuela threatening the broader international community? Why do, why do we need more international community members to be focused, laser focused, on a resolution to the crisis in Venezuela? I think you, you are completely right, Jason. And one of the most important challenge that we have is to put the spotlight on, on that issue. And as I, as I told you, we have to, to tell the truth and, 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 and underline that Maduro is a criminal state. When we have the, the meetings in the, Luma, in the Lima group, it's really amazing how you can have conversation with different countries. It's not only the case of Colombia. You see in Central America, in Chile, in Argentina, uh, in Ecuador, in every each country there is a concrete experience of Maduro financing mm -hmm. and subverting democratic order. Real people and real organizations that are working undermining democracy all over the region. The Foro de Sao Paulo that happened in Venezuela one month ago had a very clear answer, and that was the appearance of this uh, narco uh, and terrorist group in the case of Colombia. But we have many, many, many different phases of this kind of group acting. And not only in America, not only in America, we have information from Europe, for example, Germany, how this increase in, in drug traffic in Venezuela pass through Africa and then to Europe, financing also radical groups that uh, has connection with uh, uh, terrorists in North Africa and Europe. And we have to be very clear, this is a threat not only for the region, it's a global threat, and we have to deal with a lot of strength and to be very clear that the worst things that can happen with Venezuela is that anything happen. We cannot be accustomed that there is just a problem that is in, in America. We have to put all the strength, as uh, Canciller Trujillo said, all the support in Guaido administration, all the support in Venezuelan people, and be very clear, we are close to a solution, we are close to an outcome in Venezuela, and we have a, a real incredible achievement this very year, and we can win, finally, a victory if we are able to, with the leadership of the region and all the free world, put the internal pressure and the external pressure for an outcome in Venezuela. I have one last question, same question for both of you before, before turning over to, to Damon and, and, and closing remarks here. Uh, we, the Atlantic Council, we like to do a lot of perspective, we like to do futures work. Uh, so I'm gonna ask a question along that regard is, what might happen one, two years down the road if global leaders do not actively help Venezuela, Colombia, and the rest of the region? If the calls to action, uh, Mr. Trujillo, Special Envoy Borges, that you are making today, if world leaders don't heed those calls, Money assistance doesn't come into Colombia. More recognition of Juan Guaido does not come in. What does that scenario for each of you look like one or two years down the road? Well, in my opinion, there is no possibility that we should see Maduro in power one or two years ahead. That's possible. But where we have to be aware that right now, if we don't make the final steps in order to increase pressure and to build all the options that we have for the future in order for, for rebuilding Venezuela, the situation could be in a very dangerous scenario in which everything could be out of control. Not only migration. Migration is the most visible situation, is the most painful situation, but in my view there are other things more invisible, like drug traffics, guerrilla groups, a organized crime, that if we, if we do not deal this with all the strength, 
all the situation could be out of the control of the whole region. And that's the most important trend that we have right now. Minister. No, I, I fully agree with what Julio has said. And let me tell you one more thing from a different perspective, but the same, the same re reason of being. World democracies has to invest in democracy. World democracies has to invest in freedom. World democracies has to invest, to invest in market economy. World democracies has to invest, invest in creating the conditions for democracy and freedom to flourish. So that is to say that today, today, the highest duty of world democracies is investing in democracy and freedom so that Venezuela can live in a different situation in which they are living now. If world democracy doesn't invest today, doesn't act today as they should, they will be serving tyrannies and dictatorship. That would mean losing completely the basis that we defend as Democrats. So my new call, besides the call that I have already made, is to the world democracy to invest in democracy and to invest in freedom. What are your final remark? Well, I would like to make a, a final remark, but in Spanish, if you allow me. Eh, hace un año estábamos Carlos Vecchio y mi persona y muchos de ustedes eh, trabajando aquí en la Asamblea General de Naciones Unidas con todo el proceso que se veía venir de la finalización del régimen de Maduro y su periodo presidencial denunciando la elección del 20 de mayo como una elección falsa y buscando el reconocimiento del Parlamento. Y afortunadamente muchos de ustedes nos apoyaron en toda esta lucha. Hace un año estaba con nosotros Fernando Albán y quiero reconocer hoy quien está acá a Meudi Ocio, su esposa. Fernando Albán que estuvo con nosotros hace un año acá, volvió a Venezuela, fue puesto en la cárcel y fue asesinado por el régimen de Maduro. Meudi, Fernando, el mejor homenaje que le hacemos todos, y ustedes saben que era mi hermano personal, mi mano derecha, es recordarlo siempre por la lucha de nuestro país y como un símbolo de lo que significa la Venezuela que será libre y que tantos de ustedes, como Fernando y como tantos amigos, hemos pasado por exilio, por cárcel, por torturas y en este caso por muerte. Donde esté Fernando, esta lucha también es para ti para toda Venezuela. Muchas gracias. Much, muchas gracias. Muchísimas gracias. Enviar a especial a Julio, otra vez, Meudi, nuestro apoyo con, contigo con, con todo, ¿no? Uh, I, want, I want to say at the end just one quick, one quick comment, which is cuenta con el apoyo total del Atlantic Council. Count with the full support of the Atlantic Council. Uh, the Atlantic Council, we, we have been working uh, for years on accelerating a peaceful democratic transition, and this is a priority not just for the Adrian Arts Latin America Center that I direct, but for the organization as a, as a whole. Uh, and, uh, and I can't thank you enough for both of your, your leadership, uh, all the Venezuelans in the room, and all the other diplomatic representatives who are here. Uh, with that, uh, I want to uh, thank you again and, and thank the, uh, uh, everybody here. And now turn it over to Damon Wilson, the Executive Vice President uh, of the Atlantic Council, who will provide us with a couple of closing thoughts. Damon. Thank you very much, Jason. Thank you. I want to just close briefly here, but first, Thank you for your words just now. I think what we've heard um, from both of you, Mr. Minister, Special Envoy Boris, is a sense of absolute clarity about what's at stake, what our responsibility is, and calling on us not to be a sense of despair from what we see, but a call to action. And that's what animates, I think, the Atlantic Council, the Adrian Arch Latin America Center, and our work. 
Venezuela is on the front line of freedom. We need to invest in that freedom and democracy, as you said, Mr. Minister. I think today's conversation captured beautifully that the security, prosperity, and stability of the Western Hemisphere is under threat by a criminal narco regime, and the scale so far of the international response does not match the depth and breadth of the crisis. So I think for all of us, the way the Atlantic Council works is we build communities, communities of influence that can work in common cause. How can we step up our collective effort to defend freedom, democracy, respect for human rights, not just in Venezuela, but more broadly through the region and the world? This has long ceased to be a Venezuela problem. And the outcome of this crisis will not only determine the country's future, but the prosperity, growth, and development for the region, it's also an opening salvo of an era of great power competition. So as Jason said, for the Atlantic Council, this isn't a project, this isn't an event, this isn't a gathering. We have purpose, we're on a mission. This is a strategic priority for the Council. This team will not rest until we figure out how to play our part in finding a peaceful solution to the crisis that restores peace and prosperity to the Venezuelan people who have long suffered. I want to thank our team. I want to thank uh, Foreign Policy, Yahoo Finance. I want to thank Adrian Arsht for her leadership on this, Melanie Chin on our board, a driving force on these issues, our partners in stabilization, the Assistant Secretary, Nat uh, Denise Natalie, thank you for your engagement. Other officials we have from the European Union, from the U.S. government, from the region in particular, and especially for all of the Venezuelans who are fighting this fight every day, we stand with you. We want to support you. And we are through, we'll stand with you until this cause is done and you have freedom in your country. Thank you so much for get, coming today and stay, stay engaged with our work on Venezuela, hashtag AC Venezuela. Please stay part of this campaign. Thank you.